the city, a life support system for millions of people. Houses that stretch to the sky or sprawl along the ground. This is our man-made environment, a complex machine laboring to meet the needs of all the people who live here. Our man-made environment. It can be designed to meet the need for beauty. can be designed, but most of the time it just grows. A city is a place to live, work, and play, but most of all, a city is people. Most people live in neighborhoods, the basic building blocks of a city. The George Jackson family lives in the Tacoma Park neighborhood in Washington, D.C. A neighborhood is where lots of people live. They go to the same schools, usually. It's a block that has houses and people and alleys and streets. Well, this neighborhood I like because it's, it's not as crowded. The population density isn't as great here as in a lot of other sections of the district. The uh, houses are all detached. And uh, from this aspect, I think it makes it nicer because I feel that where people are kind of pushed and crowded together, you know, it's not as, uh, not as pleasant. It's fairly convenient. You know, it's not too far to the uh, to a bus stop, and then it's it's fairly close uh, to Georgia Avenue, where there is a a big Safeway if you want to use it, so that you really are right in within walking distance between two lines that lead downtown, which do, does give you a a feeling of uh, convenient location. Yeah, you can go down the street and you can play tennis. Or there's a playground about two blocks away. Basketball courts down there. Things like that. I like it also because it's clean. And the people around the neighborhood seemingly have a lot of pride of um, ownership and whatnot, and they keep their places fairly nice, considering the age of houses. Because the average age of a house, I guess, in this area would be 40 years. The chief thing that I've probably disliked about the neighborhood would probably have been the school, the elementary schools in this area. 
They're very old and overcrowded for the most part. And some temporary buildings have had to have been built last year. But the schools are quite old, and I should think that an area, you know, like this or any area should have nice modern schools. Should be a very pleasant and should be one of the finest structures of the neighborhood instead of one of the older and least desirable structures in the neighborhood. Not all neighborhoods are pleasant, livable places. Some deteriorate to the point where there is often no choice but to destroy the crumbling houses and start over again. Anne Turpo describes some of the hardships caused by this urban renewal process. This looks like a deserted street, but it really is not. Three or four families still live here. More than six years ago, their friends and neighbors started moving away because urban renewal was coming to their block. Most people would not choose to live on a street where they were the last families left. The sanitation crews do not come through anymore. The policemen do not make a foot patrol through the area. It's terribly depressing. Most families suffer these type of indignities because there's no place else to go. City planners like Mrs. Turpo work to preserve the feeling of community when urban renewal shatters an old neighborhood. Houses that have stood for a hundred years come crashing down in a day. Eventually, new houses are built. These houses were partly designed by people from the old neighborhood. Architects and new residents worked together to design not only the houses, but the open spaces around them. But there is more to planning a new community than just providing well-designed houses. When the first families moved back into the area, many were very disappointed that so few new facilities, essential services, had been built in the area. There were no new stores, uh, no new playgrounds, and small areas for tots to play. Uh, this is one of the difficulties with urban renewal planning, making sure that everything comes out on time that by the time new families are ready to move in, that you have new schools ready for them, that there are new health facilities, and that there are playgrounds, and uh, that the transportation is adequate for the family. One way to make the man-made environment not only livable, but beautiful, is to design it from the ground up. New towns and cities are springing up all over the world. The new city of Columbia, Maryland is rising on 15,000 acres of farmland, halfway between the overcrowded cities of Baltimore and Washington. The chief planner of Columbia is Morton Hoppenfeld. We decided that we would try to build a city of about 100,000 people. 
And that we felt that was a pretty good size to try since it was the first one that we were going to do. And we decided that we didn't want it to be a very dense city, you know, not a lot of people living on a little bit of land with high buildings and the like. And it's not to say there's anything wrong with that. It's just different. But that it would be a, a relatively loose and open city. It would have its apartments, but there would be trees around them and so on. And that was a kind of a city, a kind of a style that we thought people were looking for right now. The difference, I suppose, between what we did and the way most other either city building or rebuilding efforts is that we started from the big question as to what's a city for. Basically, we concluded that the city was to help people live more fulfilling, exciting, happy lives. And to that extent, you can't tell whether it's a good city just by looking at it. You have to really get in there and talk to the people. I think it has to have a lot of open spaces yeah. and or parks and nice places where you can stay, be. Transportation, things like that. Yeah, and, and slum prevention, clean and open. Places for recreation, nightclubs, you know, stuff to keep the kids busy, keep them off the street. And so we ended up with a concept of neighborhoods, where at the middle of the neighborhood was the elementary school and daycare center. How large is a neighborhood? It should be large enough to include a variety of people, but small enough so the people can get to know one another. A neighborhood should be large enough to support an elementary school, but small enough so the school isn't overcrowded. Columbia planners decided that each elementary school would have 600 students. Population statistics told them that in the average family, six-tenths of a child goes to elementary school. I don't know if you've ever seen six-tenths of a kid on his way to elementary school, but that's the way it works. Basic arithmetic told the planners that an elementary school of 600 students needs a neighborhood of 1,000 families. A thousand families will also comfortably support a daycare center, a small grocery store and snack bar, and a swimming pool. When all these things were within, oh, maybe at most a half a mile walking distance, and you could get there without having to cross a major street and get, you know, get killed in the process. The elementary school is the core of a neighborhood, and the high school is the core of a larger unit of people, a village. Columbia planners discovered it would take 3,000 families to fill a high school of 1,500 students. So they combined three neighborhoods to form a village. These neighborhoods are grouped around a village center, which includes not only the high school, but a supermarket, which also needs about 3,000 families supporting it. There is a plaza at the village center and a variety of interesting shops. In every village, there is also some special recreational facility such as an Olympic-size, year-round swimming pool. This gets people to move from village to village and meet new people. The village centers are planned with an eye toward beauty and good design, pleasant, inviting places to be. Those things which are not available in a village can be found in the downtown area. Downtown is for the one-of-a-kind things, the big stores and shopping malls, office buildings and hotels. Downtown Columbia doesn't look like downtown anywhere else. This is partly because Columbia is still small, still growing. But even when 100,000 people live here, 
the downtown will still look different. It will always include a place for parks, trees, fountains, lakes, a place for people. And there are not too many downtowns in too many cities where you see kids riding out to the end of the pier and dropping a line off to catch a fish while their father might be looking down from a window where they were. And that's kind of good. Not everyone wants to live in Colombia. Some people like it and others do not. It's clean, there's a lot of green space, a lot of fresh air. It's not uh, overly crowded, but yet there's still people around. I mean, you don't have people shoving you, pushing, fighting, you know, like a pack of rats. Everything is so open wide and there's no ugly big signs, you know, that you see in other cities. It's just a little phony, you know. Like, it's, it's kind of like the best of everything, but it doesn't work sometimes, you know? Like some, some of the, the parks and the, uh, the waterfalls and the springs all seem just a little too planned, you know? Columbia is planned, but I don't know. Well, Columbia's got community, though, and that's what most cities need. They're so depersonalized. It's incredible. You, you never know anybody. You don't even have real neighborhoods anymore. You know, where a whole block is a, a big group. Except I feel it more here than... This Images and Things program was produced by the Northern Virginia Educational Television Association for NIT, National Instructional Television, in association with a consortium of 26 educational agencies.